Let me um, just the first thing that I need to do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I come from a wine area. Ah, okay. Yeah, uh, Rhine uh, Valley. Rhine River Valley. Famous wine area. Yes. Yeah. Uh, mm. <laughs> just so I have it on tape, your name is. I'm uh, Dr. Alfred P. for Peter Wehner, W-E-H-N-E-R. And so where did you, did you grow up in the Rhine Valley? Where, where, where? Yes, uh, in Wiesbaden, it's uh, spelled W-I-E-S-B-A-D-E-N. It's uh, situated about 20 miles west of Frankfurt at the Rhine River. And Wiesbaden, uh, right after the war for a number of years, was uh, headquarters for the United States Air Force in Europe. That's why that name is so familiar. Mm -hmm. What? Uh, um, so you were born in what year? 1926. 1926. October 23rd, 1926. What, what did your dad do? My dad uh, was a dentist. Yeah. Like father, like son. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he would have loved to see me stay there and. Uh, uh, work together with him. You know, it's, it's interesting because um, growing up when I did and teaching World War II, they never gave any perspective other than the American perspective on yeah. World War II. And we forget that, that uh, war affected everybody. Um, I sure they, did. they always talk about the U.S. and we were in a depression and the war brought us out of the depression. But what was Germany like growing up at, when you were a child? Well, uh, before Hitler came, uh, the uh, uh, economic situation was uh, bad and uh, getting worse. There were, I've forgotten now, something like 40 parties in the uh, parliament, the equivalent of, of the parliament, and everyone was pulling in a different direction. And uh, uh, it crystallized then into two camps, the, uh, uh, the communists who wanted the international labor movement, uh, workers of the world unite under the leadership of the Soviet Union, and uh, they were uh, pretty brutal, it was a rough bunch, and uh, the only ones who went into the street to fight them were the Nazis, the National Socialists. And uh, so it came down for uh, for many uh, Germans to a choice between uh, a uh, red Germany or a uh, Germany under Hitler and what what he promised, what he talked about sounded uh, very good. Um, he wanted, he stressed that he wanted uh, uh, peace, but uh, equality uh, for the German people, for the nation, in the family of nations. And he uh, stressed frequently that he was a, uh, uh, a soldier in the front line of uh, World War I and knew what war is and that if he can help it, uh, he never wants another war. And uh, uh, he came to power, of course, uh, legally. He was appointed uh, uh, chancellor by uh, President Hindenburg, uh, who was a World War I hero, and uh, by that time, in 1933, already a, a pretty old, uh, some uh, even say feeble man. In any event, uh, he came to power, and uh, he did uh, remarkably good, uh, efficient things, which of course you can do only if you're a dictator. You don't have an opposition in Parliament, you know. But uh, he, um, not he personally, but uh, the, the Nazi Party, which became the government, it was synonymous. The Nazi Party was the, the German government. Uh, they initiated programs like uh, Mother and Child, uh, giving support to uh, uh, poor mothers, and uh, there was an organization called Winterhilfswerk, 
Winter Aid Organization, and their slogan was, uh, nobody uh, shall starve and freeze. Now, who could be against that? And that all sounded great. And uh, in fact, the, the uh, uh, number of, of uh, unemployed people shrank rapidly. And the bums and beggars disappeared. So everything looked very good. But um, he, of course, was a fascinating speaker. Uh, he started with a low tone and then worked himself up. And when I look at tapes now, uh, from my American perspective, I have to ask myself, is this man insane? How he ranted and screamed? But in those days, uh, uh, he just mesmerized people. And um, the uh, fire of the uh, Reichstag, the, the uh, German parliament in, uh, I believe it was in 34, uh, which was started by a um, dim-witted Dutch communist. And uh, whether Goering was behind it, it's a controversy. It has never been uh, determined. But in any event, the uh, uh, Reichstag went up in flames. And uh, Hitler and the, the German government, meaning the Nazi party, uh, portrayed that as a signal uh, for a red revolt, a coup to uh, bring the um, uh, government down, meaning the, the Nazi government, and replace it uh, with the uh, uh, red the communist government. And uh, to put that putsch down, this revolt, uh, the Nazis uh, resorted to the very brutal and direct measures, and uh, uh, a lot of people were executed there, and I have no doubt that some personal differences were settled too. But uh, he... Was, would this have been similar to, say, I, I, I mean, because we didn't have a war at that point, would this be similar to, say, the U.S. Uh, um, unions and uh, yeah. so I mean, it's right. thugs to a certain extent. Uh, right, street, yeah. Street fighting, I guess. Yes, and, and the communists, they wanted to, to bring down the, the Nazi government, you know. And um, at that time, uh, Hindenburg was still alive, and Hitler asked Hindenburg, who was sort of the figurehead, but uh, very respected by the, uh, was sort of a father figure for the Germans. Hitler asked Hindenburg for the uh, so-called Ermächtigungsgesetz, which means the law to give them uh, uh, pretty much uh, total powers to put down that putsch to save the fatherland from the, rough, uh, from the uh, Red Revolution, uh, which Hindenburg did. And shortly thereafter, Hindenburg died. And then, of course, Hitler had all the, uh, the uh, uh, power. And he put uh, his uh, henchmen, uh, died in the wool Nazis, in uh, uh, key positions in the media. So after a very short time, you could hear on radio, there was, of course, no t TV, you could hear and read in the papers only uh, the Nazi party line. And uh, with this power, in the days before TV and satellites, um, you could very well influence the, the thinking of uh, the people. And uh, when he started his adventures, first the uh, the uh, reoccupation, uh, military reoccupation of the left uh, side uh, of uh, <coughs> the country, the, the uh, uh, German part left of the Rhine River, which was demilitarized after World War I. So he uh, 
he sent the troops back in and said, well, this is German territory, always has been. And uh, this, as he called it, the dictate of uh, Versailles, which ended World War uh, I, which in fact was a dictate. It was um, uh, very imprudent to uh, impose uh, conditions which are almost impossible to meet on the defeated uh, uh, Germans. The only ones who uh, um, foresaw potential complications, <laughs> namely another war, were the Americans, uh, Wilson. But uh, in World War II, the, the Americans uh, did not uh, swing the political weight uh, that they did after World War II. And uh, in, in the spirit of the time in, in that era, there was hatred, hatred of the French against the Germans, hatred of the Germans against the French, uh, hatred of the English, of the Germans, I guess, and, and vice versa. So um, the uh, Western powers, England and France, really uh, uh, imposed conditions which caused um, a few years uh, after World War I a, a terrible uh, inflation. Uh, one dollar, which was the equivalent of four marks and 20 pennies in the old gold pre-war, World War I uh, currency, um, one dollar, four marks and 20, uh, went in uh, November 1923 to uh, something like four billion and several hundred million marks. Uh, and uh, um, you know, by the time, if you were an employee and you got paid monthly on my dad, until the patients paid their bill, uh, the money was practically worthless. And um, things like that, and then of course the, the uh, Great Depression affected the, uh, the whole world. There's a saying, uh, if America sneezes, the whole world catches a cold. And uh, all this prepared the, uh, the soil, so to speak, for a Hitler to come, to appeal to the national instincts and uh, patriotism. So it, it boiled down to uh, a choice between the Nazis and the, uh, the Red. Mm -hmm. And as I said, the, uh, the um, uh, media uh, were completely controlled by the Nazis. And uh, uh, Josef Goebbels was a, a uh, deviously brilliant uh, uh, devil. He was probably the, the smartest uh, of them all. The intellectual, uh, many of uh, anti-Nazis read his editorials in the uh, Nazi paper, Völkische Beobachter, just to enjoy the German, you know, the sentence, uh, it's like, like Churchill in England, you know. So Hitler was, I mean, and again, they've s I, I've always heard this said, Hitler was, uh, 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 was a genius, I mean, it's, and, and again, there's good and bad to being a genius. Yeah. But, but you talked about how he had set up the media, put people in control of the media, and now he's got the propaganda going. You've got, a, you've got people that, that are starving and out of work, and the money's not worth anything, and here's Hitler. There you go. And uh, so when, when he sent troops into the Rhineland, the, the German general staff sweat blood. My dad had a patient, and uh, he told him we were sweating blood because all the, the French would have to do is send one battalion in there, and the Germans would have uh, withdrawn uh, because there, there was no, uh, uh, under Versailles, uh, there were no tanks, there were no submarines, there were no airplanes, no, no warplanes. Uh, 
probably no artillery, uh, but the Western Allies did nothing. And the Germans, of course, said, well, this is our, our country. You know, it's just uh, if we would have had a, a war with Mexico, the Mexicans win and said, we can't have uh, any American troops after the war uh, south of Colorado. You know, uh, it sounded also plausible, you know. Then there was the, the Olympics in 1936, which was a masterful propaganda piece. And uh, again, he, um, he emphasized to the world that all that Germany needed is peace to give it a chance to, to build up again and uh, create jobs so that you have satisfied citizens. Well, then of course, <laughs> the ironic thing is that um, Hitler wasn't even a German. He was an Austrian. He was born in Austria, no? And um, he always had the dream, since both countries uh, spoke uh, German, to unite them. And uh, uh, when he, of course, this was all prepared by undercover types, instigation, um, acts against the war, uh, criminal uh, uh, matters. Uh, when then a Nazi leader in Austria invited the Germans in, the German troops, you know, uh, the Anschluss, the reunification, um, Hitler was greeted by tens and hundreds of thousands. You can't fake that. You know, we saw this on the, when he uh, entered Vienna, Heil, Heil, and the people were cheerful. You know? So we thought, that's good and fine. But then the Nazi propaganda started to work, uh, preparing the uh, crisis in the Sudetenland, which is the border area between uh, Germany and what uh, was then Czechoslovakia. Now it's the uh, Czech Republic. And uh, uh, things heated up, and of course, the people were always told how the the German minorities were uh, uh, suppressed and persecuted and tortured and even killed by Czech gangs, uh, with the approval of uh, Czech authorities, and um, it uh, got so bad that. Uh, uh, a war situation arose, and that is when, when uh, Chamberlain uh, went to Munich and Daladier, the French uh, premier. And uh, I really uh, feel sorry for Chamberlain. He was an, an English gentleman, and Hitler, the head of state, gave him his word that after the Sudeten question has been settled, that he has no more demands, territorial or otherwise. And as an English gentleman, he took the word of, of a foreign head of state, you know. But uh, the next year, Hitler, under some pretext, I don't know what, uh, what you said, swallowed up all of Czechoslovakia. And then, of course, that was in, in uh, 38, maybe early 39, and then he already prepared the uh, crisis with uh, Poland. And um, there, excuse me, there were reports of atrocities uh, by the Poles against German minorities in the western part of Poland. And uh, there were a lot of um, German settlements and German villages. Uh, excuse me. And wasn't some, did I read right, that, that some of the, those atrocities were actually Hitler had... Uh yeah, that comes when, when the war actually broke out. But I remember I was um, uh, 12 years old. Um, the German government um, published a white book where you saw mutilated bodies 
of uh, supposedly uh, German minorities in Poland slaughtered by Polish mobs. And uh, I remember one picture impressed me terribly. I was 12 years old. There was a woman who had just given birth, and her co corpse uh, was lying next to the baby's corpse, still connected to the mother by the umbilical cord, you know, stuff like that. Of course, it can be uh, uh, faked. And um, I am sure that there was uh, some provocation from, from the Germans living in Poland, agitated by, by the Nazis uh, secretly. And uh, then there were increasing reports of um, border violations by uh, Polish military aircraft and even troops. And um, meanwhile, Hitler always emphasizing his love of peace and leaned over backwards to, uh, to accommodate and find a solution. And then finally on uh, September 1st, of course we know now that all this uh, uh, was staged. On September 1st, he had dressed uh, concentration inmates in Polish uniforms under SS leadership and attacked a, uh, a German radio station just across the border, radio station Kleivitz. And uh, then the, the SS leaders uh, shot the inmates and called in the press and said, here, uh, for the first time, Polish troops in some strength attacked German territory. And uh, he, uh, I still hear him today with his uh, Austrian accent when he went in front of the Reichstag, the, the parliament, all of course, uh, Nazis, you know, all the others had been removed. There, there were no other parties. Uh, well, it was a one-party state, you know, with the press under control, radio under control. He, uh, in that speech, and I have a, I have a tape somewhere. Uh, he reiterated uh, how he, as a World War One soldier. Uh, knew the horrors of war and how he uh, continuously had leaned over backwards to avoid another war. But now, and he said, since 545, we are shooting back. So this is how we learned about the outbreak of war. We thought, until the very bitter end, that we were fighting in, in defense of our country. And we were not fighting for Hitler. We were, we were not Nazi soldiers. We were fighting for, for Germany. We were s German soldiers, you know. Uh, it, it's interesting because, again, I mean, hindsight, you know, now we know yeah. everything. Yeah. But to hear you just describe what Hitler said, you know, yeah. as of this time, we are now, well, I, I could play back December 7th, 1941 is a date. Same words. Yeah. But yeah. Di different pieces to it. But like you said, now you're a countryman, and Hitler is saying, I want peace, and, you know, we're yeah. protecting our peace. Yeah. Did you, uh, so at the um, 1936 Olympics, is that the one your dad was at? They drive the years, but I don't want mixed up. Are you talking about the Olympics? Yeah, I'm just backing up a little bit here. Yeah. Did you go to the Olympics with your dad? Yes, that picture was taken uh, in Berlin. Did you see Hitler or hear Hitler? Uh, not then. Uh, I saw Hitler once uh, when he visited, uh, that must have been around 1933 or 34. Um, he flew to our local uh, airport and uh, we came to, to see him, and he was uh, driving in an 
uh, in his big uh, Mercedes convertible uh, standing there, you know. And we were on a second floor balcony and he was driving right below us. And of course the, the uh, people screamed, Heil, Heil, Heil. And he looked up and did this. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I saw him there. In Berlin, I did not uh, uh, see him. Speaking about the Olympics, see, this is um, uh, what I call <coughs> the uh, <a> pop. <coughs> excuse me, the pop history uh, that the impressions people have here from the news snippets they pick up here and there. When when you mention uh, 1936 Olympics in Berlin, automatically, like the Pavlo reflex, comes up to mind. Hitler uh, refused to shake uh, Jesse Owens' hands. You know, this is, I think, just about all what the people remember here. Now, what really was the overwhelming impression is that the Americans had always have always been admired for their sense of sportsmanship and fairness. And uh, the, the best German uh, broad jump uh, fellow uh, was uh, a man by the name of Lutz Long. And when they did their practice jumps, uh, Jesse, of course, always jumped further than, than Lutz Long. Jesse uh, instructed Lutz Long in his techniques. And Jesse, one of the gold medals he won was in far jump, eight meters and three centimeters. And Lutz Long, using Jesse's technique, uh, won the silver. And that made the news all over Germany, you know, that um, Jesse Owens taught his opponent his techniques. You know, typical example of American sportsmanship. You know, we didn't even realize or know that Hitler didn't uh, uh, shake hands with uh, Jesse Owens. Hitler didn't shake hands with, with every gold medal winner, you know. So, but this is sort of the one-sided uh, presentation that you often get, just like uh, Nixon, Watergate, you know. Olympics 36, Jesse Owens, not shaking Hitler's hands, you know. Of course, I have no, no interest, <laughs> no cause to uh, defend uh, the Germans or, or Germany. But um, there are many instances uh, where you get a, um, a one-sided picture. Um, and that's bad because sometimes we can learn from history. Well, I I in a lot of ways, because again, hindsight's twenty twenty. We all know the answers now. But yeah. But when it was there, it was real, and and Hitler appeared good. Yes. And what he did, and and there was, you know, it's like anything. World War Two was terrible, but there were a lot of good things that came out of World War Two. Well, Hitler had some terrible sides, but I think oh, there was yes. also some some benefits that yeah. Hitler provided. You know, I mean, yeah. so you you have to look at the full picture. Yeah, no, of course, uh, the man was um, evil incarnate. The way he um, he steered the nation toward war, and uh, what his people his uh, leaders, particularly in, in the certain branch of the SS, did in the Eastern Territories, you know, it just defies description. This, uh, and um, even though I have left that country almost 50 years ago, um, it still weighs on me that I fought for this flag uh, because uh, we, hundreds of thousands, millions of my fellow comrades, uh, German soldiers, 
thought that we were the guys with the white hats, you know. And uh, that was perhaps the worst thing for me after the war. Uh, you can lose a war and still hold your head high if you fought a good fight for a good cause. But um, when you suddenly realize uh, the reality, what happened under that flag, it was, it was as if somebody had pulled the rug out from under me. There was a moral vacuum and uh, it took a while to, th to sink in. To we did that, you know, because I know I wouldn't have done it. None of my comrades wouldn't have done it. My father wouldn't have done it. His friends and acquaintances wouldn't have done it. My dad was a soldier. He volunteered uh, again in World War uh, II. And his fellow soldiers wouldn't have done these things. But when you see the documentation, uh, that uh, is uh, a horrible disillusionment. You know, if from the Russians, you knew it, you expected it. And when you, when you read uh, the atrocities that are commis committed in, uh, in Africa, like uh, uh, in uh, uh, Burundi and, and all the civil wars where people are mercilessly slaughtered, you say, well, it's Africa, tribal differences, you know. But uh, in the center of Europe, the people who produced Goethe, and Beethoven, that, uh, that was uh, a, uh, a bitter shock. Of course, you know, the, um, uh, the Allies bombed uh, German cities, and it was, uh, as I mentioned, uh, it was a declared war of uh, the British Air Marshal Harris, Bomber Harris, to erase um, German cities. Uh, with a declared aim of inflicting maximum uh, casualties to the civilian population. Uh, but that was a war, and the Germans had bombed uh, British cities in that war. So it was just a matter of, uh, of degree. But uh, I don't think any people know that uh, uh, more than 640,000 civilians, women, children, and old men, uh, were killed by Allied bombs. Um, now, that is not a counterweight to the German atrocities. It's just to show um, that what you would now call bad deeds uh, were committed on both sides. Uh, after the war, during the end of the war and after the war, uh, 13 million German refugees fled from the uh, eastern parts of pre-war Germany. 13 million. Or in the first year or two after the war, were forcefully evicted, the uh, German minorities in Poland and Czechoslovakia. And out of these 13 million, 2 million didn't make it, you know? So uh, these are terrible figures. And this, uh, uh, as you said, uh, I said the same thing. There is no glory in war. Uh, war is bloody, war is uh, dirty. Yet, sometimes you have to stand up and fight. Hitler had to be stopped. You know, and this is the uh, uh, tragedy, uh, tragedy that um, uh, sometimes uh, uh, seems you have no choice. And that's very well said, the, the, the way you stated that, that it's not tit for tat, it's explaining war. Yeah. You know, you are right. All sides yeah. had things that in the quote, normal world, yeah. we see as, as terrible. Yeah. And that is unfortunately yeah. some of war. Good, bad, ugly. Yeah. See, my dad 
was arrested by, uh, on the order of American authorities in August uh, 45. My dad was a party member, but had no, no, uh, he was a full-time dentist, you know. Um, he had no, no uh, rank in the party. Um, he was arrested away from his dental chair, uh, and he disappeared, um, he disappeared for 15 months. I did not know for five months whether he was alive. Um, he just disappeared. He was arrested by, by German detectives on the order of um, uh, Americans, and uh, they told him he sensed something was wrong, and he asked whether he should uh, bring along a toothbrush and uh, a pajama. He said, oh, no, I got that. It's um, uh, uh, just interrogation. And of course, um, you know, there, it was a lawless, uh, lawless period for quite some time. The German delete, uh, police was disbanded only after enough people had gone through the denazification process um, could there be a new reformed police which took many months or a year or two uh, um, and the military government had absolute uh, authority and law so um, my dad disappeared I tried to to locate him I went to, to the German police department, and they said, well, we did it on the order of Americans. We turned them over to the Americans. So I went to the uh, American uh, 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 commandant, and uh, they uh, brushed me off. And after, now there was, uh, there was a habit that a lot of German prisoners were given to the to the French, turned over to the French for doing work in the mines. And many of them perished there because the conditions there would not pass any Red Cross inspection. <laughs> um, and after five months, I got a, uh, a form letter uh, from him that with the lines where he informed me that he was uh, in an American uh, concentration camp, of course they call it internment camp, uh, in a so near a southwestern city in, in Germany. There was no arrest warrant, no accusation, no trial, nothing. They just took him, and after 15 months, they said, you can go home. You know, no reason given, nothing. Those were the times in uh, in uh, Germany in 1945, 46, and 47 in parts. And then, of course, there were the... Uh, <laughs> I was surprised, having grown up under Hitler, and see all the people cheer, heil, 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 and after the collapse, uh, everybody was an anti-fascist. You know? And of course, they had taken over the uh, the uh, uh, newspapers under the authority of uh, of the Allied occupation forces, and there were some very uh, agitating articles. Uh, for example, I remember one uh, where it said uh, Nazis uh, have to go should go into barracks. Uh, the Nazis uh, were guilty of uh, responsible for the war, and uh, some Nazis still had apartments left that were not bombed, and so many anti-fascists and refugees had nothing left, and the Nazis should be uh, uh, um, forcefully evicted from their homes, you know, from their apartments. So I was at that time 19 years old. Uh, I was alone 
uh, uh, my uh, mother left us uh, in uh, 1935, so my dad brought me up. And uh, so I had to defend the home. Uh, I fashioned some, of course, we had to turn over all weapons, all the guns and knives, e cameras, binoculars, everything had to be uh, uh, turned over to the, to the occupation forces. So in each room, uh, we had a four-room uh, apartment. I had a one had a uh, potato smasher uh, in case these guys uh, come, come in there. We had a fairly nice apartment, oil pictures and uh, Persian rugs, middle class, upper middle class, uh, culturally. Uh, and uh, over my dead body, would I have let, uh, uh, let a gang in there and take all that away? I had to and for those who wouldn't know, a potato smasher is a German grenade, correct? No, 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 no. That's a wooden club. Uh, oh, that you okay. Use, uh, really, yeah, yeah. No, I didn't have any grenades. I, I mean. just, I, I've heard that them called that, but you just had yeah. a club, to, and you were yeah, wooden, wooden club, um, and. Uh, I had some uh, kitchen knives, and uh, I hid under pillows in case I was surprised in one room. So, uh, yeah. And uh, after 15 months, my uh, dad came back, and then, of course, I had to lease the office to an anti-fascist dentist refugee because um, I could not held open, empty, uh, badly needed uh, uh, space, you know. So uh, after he returned, he could not practice because he had then to go through the denazification process, which took another, forgot now, at least a year. And the irony of all is there were five uh, classifications. Uh, number one were the uh, uh, chief culprits, like the one they hanged in, in Nuremberg and other places. And number four were the ones who just paid their dues but never did anything. And number five were the uh, entlastete, which translates into uh, uh, not guilty ones. And to be classified in Group 5, you had to prove with witnesses that you either suffered uh, under the system or helped uh, uh, persecuted people like Jews or anti-Nazis. You know? And after all that, most of them, of course, were classified number four. They were party members and to not to find any obstacles to their professional development. You know, they paid the, the two marks a month and wore the uh, party emblem. And uh, uh, most of them were number four. My dad was classified number five. So, but... Uh, did, you did, did, did you have a choice, really? I of mean, of, of, like you said, they just paid their dues. And there was only one party well, left, so... Uh, you were not forced at gunpoint, but it was known if you wanted to advance in, in certain fields, uh, when you were employed, government employee or so, uh, it, it would be helpful if you had your party membership. You, know? you were not... not there was a certain moral pressure. Well, you knew it would help you. And so you, you paid your dues. It was a German government. It was a legitimate party. So that, that is a view from, from the other side. But under Hitler was what you would call a law and order state. I'll give you an example. Um, there were, well, TVs were not, 
there, but in those prisons, I'm not talking about concentration camps, there were no, no gyms like we have here, color TV and what have you, you know, commissary. Um, at one time, we were burglarized, our apartment. And my dad uh, had, of course, a number of guns, rifles, and pistols. And um, when the a burglar left, he left one of my dad's guns on the little table next uh, to the uh, exit door. Because if you were caught as a burglar, you were sent a few months or a couple of years to, to prison. But if you were caught a burglar with a gun, uh, they locked you up and threw the key away. It's an interesting highlight. Well, um, I have given you some uh, uh, bits uh, one, from the one other side. What talk about yet is, is um, well, a couple things. It's interesting because now, right now, Nazi is a word that has a, a, a connotation with it, where then it was like talking Republican, Democrat, Nazi. Yeah. I mean, because was, yeah, nobody was. knew what was in it. But what about the, um, the Hitler Youth? When did that start and what was... Oh, uh, Hitler and the party realized very early that um, getting a hold of the youth in their formative years and uh, convert them to the national socialist philosophy uh, was very important. He had in mind a thousand year Reich, you know, and uh, if you win over the youth, then you build the foundations uh, because their children will grow up within the system. Um, the Hitler Youth actually started before he came to power. It was a, um, it's a bad comparison, but it's the, the equivalent of the Boy Scouts here. And there were a, um, it became mandatory in 1936 but before that, it was voluntary. And it had uh, the kids from 14 to 18. And then they had a subdivision that's called young folk, young people, from uh, 10 to 14. And uh, it kept the kids uh, off the street. You know. And uh, it was sort of what we were instilled with the uh, party ideology, uh, the heroes of World War I, no heroic acts, and uh, um, physically training. To Hitler said he wants the German youth to be um, quick as greyhounds, tough. Uh, like leather and hard like a cope steel, you know. So, in contrast to the Boy Scouts, uh, uh, there was a, in the Hitler Youth, for example, uh, you could learn rifle training, and as I mentioned to you, they had the motor, motor branch where the kids could drive motorcycles, which was not otherwise possible. You had the, the uh, Navy, Hitler Youth, uh, where they went on uh, uh, sailing ships and uh, uh, got all the, the training that, I guess, uh, naval recruits in those days uh, did, in a reduced way, of course. And then they had the, um, the uh, flying branch, Flieger uh, Hitler Jugend, and uh, I joined that, uh, that uh, branch. Now you said you compared it to the Boy Scouts, and then you said, "But that's not a good comparison." But no. yet, what you described sounds like. Yeah, but um, the Boy Scouts are more. They are, they are teaching the uh, Judeo-Christian values, and uh, there was nothing of that in the Hitler Youth. Um, you were trained to be tough. Uh, compassion, 
uh, was ridiculed. Uh, hart wie Kruppstahl, hard like steel, you know, tough like leather. Um, it was, um, in a way, a youth, youthful form of paramilitary education. You know. And then, of course, you have the indoctrination, uh, the, the heroes of the party, and uh, the closed order drills, uh, and uh, there we had, uh, we had, it was called service, uh, Wednesdays and uh, Saturday afternoons and Sunday mornings. And um, when we went out into the country, there were war games and uh, closed order drills. Uh, and when we were indoors in the evenings, uh, we uh, recited to the auntieth time the curriculum vitae of the Führer. Uh, this type of thing, you know, you were indoctrinated. So there weren't uh, uh, schmores and uh, uh, campfire songs? This was well, there were campfire songs, but they were martial campfire songs. Again, you know, it it's, was a very clever infiltration of the uh, uh, impressionable uh, young mind uh, toward that ultimate goal to, to make what Hitler would call a, a good German tough. And Boys and girls? Were there girls? Yes, there were. Um, uh, the, uh, the girls was the League of German Girls, Bund Deutscher Mädels, and um, they, uh, of course I wasn't, <laughs> wasn't in that branch, uh, but they had also uh, athletics and um, prepared for, being prepared for motherhood and um, uh, this type of thing, and uh, songs, yeah. So you got in the Hitler Youth. H how old were you when you? Well, I uh, uh, volunteered too um, after my mother left. Um, I was, uh, let's see, nine years old then. And frankly, <laughs> pretty soon I had my brim full. I, um, uh, my dad was a cultured man, and he had cultured friends and, and acquaintances, and um, that tough stuff, you know, <coughs> that pretty soon turned me off. Um, it's perhaps understandable that in the beginning the uniform uh, has an appeal, you know, and you see those big drums and uh, the fanfares and ah. Fine, but af after a few months, uh, I uh, uh, I was not a good Hitler youth. Now, I uh, was fortunate because my dad was a member of, of the German Olympic team, and he was an old party member. And that means uh, before Hitler came to power, he he had joined the the party, and. Uh, as a dentist, a member of the Olympic team, he had a certain prestige in, uh, in uh, my hometown. And he wrote an affidavit to the Hitler Youth leaders that he needs me for his Olympic practice because I went down, uh, you know, where the uh, 50 meters, where the target is, they had a ditch, and uh, you had a um, a, a stick with a round, uh, uh, with a white circle, where you uh, indicated where the shot was, you know, and uh, that worked. So I, I uh, no longer attended the service. Um, who, who, were, who were the um, here? Their scoutmasters. Who, who were the the leaders? Kids who were two years older. Yeah, and that shows you the fallacy of uh, of this system. Um, these youngsters could not possibly have the maturity to lead 
other youngsters uh, be examples other than just presenting the tough guy, you know. But uh, interestingly enough, had my father not been an old uh, member and uh, an, um, a member of the Olympic team, this affidavit would have been interpreted as anti-Nazi. You know, he wants to keep me away from the Hitler Youth. Yeah, so. And, no? and that's when, I assume, something like that would be when you saw that Hitler wasn't this peaceful. Uh, no, not then. Not then. Not no. then, because uh, uh, Goebbels, with his uh, uh, very refined propaganda, uh, presented us as being. Uh, uh, in, a, in a defensive posture. We did not want war, you know. Um, I thought at the time, well, I'm just not a good Hitler youth, I'm just not a good Nazi, uh, because I don't like that rough stuff, you know. I'm, uh, I've always been uh, an individualist. Uh, I'm not a joiner, and I'm not a leader. Um, I march uh, by my own drummer, but if there's a crisis, I take over, you know. But I don't want to lead, and I don't want to follow unless I see a good reason to follow, you know. So uh, this may have entered in, into the picture. As a youth, did you have a concept of America? Yes, yes. Um, my grand aunt uh, and her husband immigrated uh, to the States after World War I. And she visited us, I must have been about uh, oh, four or five years old, Aunt Mary from New York. Aunt Mary was a big event when she came and uh, still remember her. In fact, um, when I immigrated, I, I came to New York, not to her, but I visited her several times, uh, yeah. And she told me about America, where they had these huge buildings called skyscrapers, you know, and earthquakes, and uh, to get to America, you had to go on a, on a big boat and you had to be on that boat for 10 days, you know, only water, you know. Oh, I was enormously impressed. And then, when I was about 11 or 12, um, we had a, a German news uh, youth writer. Uh, his name was Karl May. And uh, he published uh, 34 books before he died, and then his group continued publishing another 30 books. But he was a remarkable man. He described his adventures, his travel adventures all over the world, and it was actually fictitious. The guy has never been here until after he got rich, and then he only came uh, to, the, to the eastern states, and, and I think he saw the Niagara Falls. But in any event, uh, he described his adventures in the Wild West with the Indians. And uh, uh, people have been amazed how accurately he described the conditions of the, in the United States and the scenery, the landscape in the United States. And I learned a lot uh, from Karl May about the United States. Uh, <coughs> about the Ku Klux Klan, and interestingly enough, he died in 1912. Already in those days, uh, when Hollywood, 20, 30 years later, they still made the movies The Bad Indians and The Good White Guys, you know, he already uh, uh, 
He described good Indians and bad Indians, and he described good whites and bad whites, very realistically. His clash with the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, so I read, I read a lot about America, and uh, there was one other aspect. Um, my dad uh, was one of the relatively few uh, people who had a uh, car. He bought a used car. Cars were fairly, not rare, but not too frequent on German roads before uh, World War II. And um, like so many uh, German drivers uh, of that era, uh, when somebody wanted to pass you, that was a personal <laughs> challenge of your honor. You know? And then this insane uh, road race started, which often kept the surgeons busy and the undertakers. And my dad had a front wheel drive, which gave him a, uh, a certain advantage in, in these narrow curving uh, German roads. And uh, very rarely did somebody succeed in passing my dad. With one exception, you know, there came a car, a big car, behind us, and my dad had his car floored, you know, and regardless of front wheel drive and his, his driving skills, that guy just passed us like we were parked. And my dad said, well, that's an American, an American car, <laughs> you know. And that impressed me no end. Yeah, I was then uh, 10, 11, 12 years old, where your dad is a smartest, the strongest, and the best, you know, and every, everything German is the best, you know. So, yeah, I, uh, I knew uh, uh, a lot about America, and this uh, has actually planted the bug in my heart to, uh, to come and see this uh, great country. I have traveled in a lot of countries, and uh, I consider my travels the most uh, uh, educating experiences in my life. You see other cultures. You realize that you're not uh, the center of the universe. Naturally, you see yourself and everything around you is on the periphery. But when you travel in, in other countries, and you see the different customs, you get a wider perspective. And uh, uh, I, I can say, of all the countries I have traveled in, uh, America is by far the greatest. It's, uh, I voted with my feet. You know, I, I got my degrees in, in Germany. Uh, my father would have been happy to have me as an associate. I had everything on a silver platter. I was a young Dr. Weiner. Uh, but as uh, soon as I got my last degree, I packed and left. And here I am. <laughs> Wasn't always easy, but... I've got to switch tapes here. Just